You ever ask yourself the question, why did God create certain animals? Why did God create certain animals? This is probably my number one animal that I want to ask why God did, created the mosquito. I have actually a better question for Noah regarding the mosquito. It would have taken just like that, right, on the ark, just like wherever those two mosquitoes were hanging out, just that would have taken care of a lot of issues for us southern people. Why did God create that animal? Here's another one you got to love and ask, why did God create this guy? <clears throat> the roach. When we lived in Las Vegas, they have uh, roaches that get really big, and they live in the concrete walls that surround almost every house in Las Vegas. And in the summer, when it gets really hot, they decide it's better to be in the house than in the walls. And so they tend to make their way into the houses. Roach is about that big. I know that's like a lot of your worst nightmare. How about this guy? Why did God create the slug? If you've ever stepped on one of these barefoot, then you got that question, right? Like what purpose does the slug serve other than just being nasty? The slug, how about this? Some of you are going to hate me for this. Like some of you are fans of snakes, I have found out. There's a reason God cursed the snake, I think. Right out of the gate, Genesis 3 put a curse on this guy. Um, but we have some people in our, on our congregation that are fans of the snake and even own snakes. I'm not sure a person that owns a snake can be a Christian. But <laughs> And then the one guy, I won't call him by name, Eric, um, <laughs> not only owns snakes but has a snake tattooed on his arm or body somewhere snakes. I'm not a fan of snakes. Toby usually finds a snake or two a year around our house, and uh, even if they're harmless, I'll admit if they're harmless, I try to get them back in the woods and let them go, but I can't really separate the harmless from the non-harmless. One of my favorite moments in our move to the wonderful state of Alabama is my wife calling me up when I was traveling and saying, Devin, there's a snake in the yard. What do I need to do? I'm like, I don't know. Go in the garage and find something. If you don't want to just shoo it back into the woods, go find something to get rid of it. And so she found a like a 40-pound mallet in our garage, and she was home for work in her high heels. So my, one of my favorite images is my precious little wife in her high heels trying to kill a snake in our front yard with a 40-pound mallet. <laughs> Snakes, why do they show up? All right, how about this? I'm going to get a lot of hate for this. <clears throat> cats, what's the purpose of cats? All right, I'll just move past cats because I know um, now, I know, that's grumpy cat, I, I know that, that animals like this serve a purpose in our system, right, our ecosystem. As a matter of fact, we had the opportunity last year to go uh, to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, it was part of our vacation, and when we were in San Juan, we decided that we were going to go cave exploring, and so we went, I've got a few pictures of our trip, we went cave exploring, um, there's Zach and I rappelling down to where the cave was, uh, there's the cave that we went into. And this is, I think, just a family picture outside the cave. But when we got into this cave, we discovered that it was a bat cave, which kind of knew that going in. Um, and, and they only let you in a, to a certain spot in the cave. You can't really go fully into the cave because that's kind of how the cave ecosystem works there. Thirteen species of bats. Um, and you could hear them and see them flying. There's something about the guy couldn't shine the spotlight up there. There's something about a bat can't go directly into a spotlight or something. But um, so we could kind of see, sense the bats, hear the bats, see the occasional bat, occasionally, which we were okay with, until he started explaining the rest of wildlife that had to live in that cave for those bats to survive. Spiders as big as my hand, which we discovered were like four feet from us on the walls when we shined the light over there. Um, if you think that roach was bad, there was roach-type bugs in there like this big. And then my favorite, he said, in order for the rats and the, the giant um, spiders and the frogs, thousands of species of frogs, for all these things to survive, we also have to have one of our favorite characters, which is the boa constrictor. And so all of those were inside this cave that we were in. And after about five minutes, we realized um, we didn't want to be in there much longer. So we wanted to get out as quickly as possible. You ask, why did God create all these different types of animals? What purpose do they serve? They do serve some purpose. Now, there's one animal we're going to talk about today that, again, we have to ask the question. Why did God create this animal? And this is the animal, the sheep. 
Why does the sheep exist? Now, if you know anything about the sheep, you know he's not the smartest animal in the kingdom. If you research the sheep, he's actually a few sandwiches short of a full picnic for sure. Not the smartest guy in the animal kingdom. You're not going to see sheep at any kind of animal show jumping through hoops. You're not going to see sheep walking the high wire, sounding more and more like a cat all along. We actually took my kids to um, a, 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 some type of, of park or something, SeaWorld type thing. We were living on the West Coast in California, and they had this massive dog show. And so all these dogs were coming out doing amazing things, turning backflips, jumping through stuff, climbing stuff, fetching stuff, all these amazing tricks that these dogs were doing that will blow your mind. And then in the middle of the show, they were like, now we're going to have a cat perform. And the cat basically came out and grabbed a ball of yarn and ran off. I'm like, okay, that explains. That right there summarizes everything. The dolls can do all these amazing tricks. The cat is capable of grabbing a ball of yarn. Uh, That's kind of the same category as the sheep. Now, what is the purpose of a sheep? It's not for its meat, right? The name of the meat that we get from sheep is mutton. Like, that should say everything, like mutton. You can have a steak or you can have mutton, right? Um, We do get some milk from a sheep, but it's not good. It's not good milk, like he's way down the totem pole from the cow when it comes to quality of milk. So its purpose is not really meat, it's not milk, it's basically got one purpose, to grow wool, right? The wool. So how would you like to know that your purpose in life was to get a haircut? Like that's the purpose of the sheep, grow wool, get a haircut. If you know anything about sheep, they basically stand in herds, they're close talkers, all, if you see a, a big group of sheep, they're all standing like one inch apart. They're close talkers. They're not even smart enough to get away. You never see sheep like having to be confined by a fence. Don't you wish somebody would just stand and yell at the sheep like, run for it. Go. There's nothing holding you here. There's no fences. Just, just go. But the sheep is not even smart enough to make a run for it. They basically live life as close talkers, standing in a herd and eat whatever is put in front of them until it's gone. Some of you wives are thinking, that's my husband right there. He just eats whatever's in front of him till it's gone, and then I have to feed him again. If the sheep has to move on its own to find food, it will die. It has to be led to its next meal, sounding more and more like your husband's. The sheep can't go out and hunt food. It has to be led to food. And you can lead them anywhere with food. They demand more attention because they can't take care of themselves. Man, this sounds so much like husbands, right? They demand so much attention because they can't provide for them. They can't take care of themselves. They eat whatever's in front of them. If you boil it down, sheep are very helpless and they're very defenseless. Here's the bottom line. Sheep must have a shepherd or they die. Sheep must have a leader, a shepherd, or they die. We're in this series called Escape. It is about a man named Jesus who we believe controls life and death. Death was not on his timetable. He conquered death and offers eternal life to his followers. We learned last week that the people around him wanted him dead, even from the time he was a toddler. They wanted him dead, but they could not kill him because he was in control of his death. Death was on his timetable. The New Testament says repeatedly his time had not come when they wanted him dead, and so they could not kill him because he controlled life and death. Instead of being killed when they wanted him dead, Jesus sacrifices his life and then conquers death, and he does so in order to provide eternal life, to do what we can't do to overcome both the sin problem and its consequences, which is death, according to the New Testament. Jesus lived and conquered death so that we might live. So that in the end, we might conquer death. Not just the fear of death. We can try and do things to overcome the fear of death. But I'm not necessarily afraid of dying. I'm afraid of getting dead, right? Like, how's it going to happen? But Jesus not only promises to overcome the fear of death, but that we can conquer death itself, even though we are bound to its grip. Now, think about that. If I told you that I was going to conquer death, 
that I was going to die, but I was going to come back. That I was going to conquer death. I'm going to die, and then after three days, I'm going to come back from the dead. I'm going to conquer death. If I told you that, you would think that I was insane. Especially if I was like a sheep and I was a close talker, right? If I called you over and said it really close to you, hey, I'm going to conquer death, coming back to life after three days, you'd be like, keep that guy away from me. But that's what Jesus claimed, that he would die and that he would come back to life. Devin, what does this have to do with sheep? We're in John chapter 10, and Jesus is illustrating his relationship with his followers by using the imagery of a shepherd and his sheep. And for the first part of the chapter, Jesus explains that the shepherd knows the sheep, he leads the sheep, he protects the sheep, he delivers the sheep from danger, all the things that we expect a shepherd to do. He provides for his sheep everything that is on the shepherd's job description, Jesus describes in the first part of the chapter. Very common imagery in his culture. And so as Jesus is telling about the shepherd and the sheep, Those that were in his presence, those that were in the crowd listening, there's no doubt they were nodding their head in approval, and they knew about a shepherd. They knew about a sheep. What Jesus described in the first part of the chapter made sense to them. He leads them. He protects them from danger. He watches over them. He leads them to food. Very common imagery of a shepherd and his sheep in Jesus' time. And then we come to John 10, verse 11, and the plot changes entirely. John 10, 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is a plot twist that was unexpected in Jesus' time. Everything changes. In Jesus' imagery, not only does the shepherd do everything that is expected for him to do, but he does the unexpected. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He sacrifices his life for the life of the shepherd. That is unheard of. It doesn't even really make sense that a shepherd would die for sheep. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, Those of you that know us very well at all, you know that we, um, part of our family is our, our dog. We have a Brittany Spaniel named Toby that we Love isn't a part of our family. But let me put Toby's perspective in relation, or Toby's relationship in our family in perspective for you. If I was forced to make a decision of someone leaving our family or someone in my family that would have to sacrifice their life, like people that I would protect in our family from dying, Toby would not even be on the list, right? If, if someone said, Devin, you have five people that you can protect, okay? You can protect their life at all costs. You have five people. What five people do you want to choose from your family? Like, Toby is not even a second thought that he's not going to make the list. If they came to me and said, Devin, we've done an analysis on your family. Um, you're spending too much money. You've got to cut back on the spending. So you need to eliminate someone from your family and eliminate cost. I'm not going to sit down with a pen and piece of paper and say, all right, let me see how much is Ashley spending a month? How much are we spending on dog food a month? I need to figure out who's going to survive the cut. Like I wouldn't even have that conversation. That thought would not even enter my mind. It would not even be entertained. We love our dog. We love that he's a part of our family. We don't want our family to be without him. But in perspective, he doesn't even make the list of consideration when it comes to life and death matters. It would make no sense for me as the homeowner and the master of this dog, right, to lay down my life for him. It makes no sense. It would make no sense for me to leave a wife and children behind and sacrifice my life for a dog. And if I did that, people would look at me rightfully and say, you're a fool. 
And the imagery that Jesus gives is a good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for sheep. And his audience gasps and says, what are you talking, that doesn't even make sense. Here's the question. Is this a good shepherd that would lay down his life for sheep? The description is good shepherd. That word good means noble, attractive, desirable. Here's what's good. More than just being willing to die, more than just being prepared to die, and a shepherd in that culture, needed to be able to, to fight, to fight off predators and things like that. But more than being, able, being willing and prepared to fight, this shepherd lays down his life, and then the Bible describes him as a good shepherd. In reality, if we know that culture, shepherds had to avoid death at all costs. Because the death of the shepherd leaves the flock unprotected. The death of the shepherd meant the death of the sheep. They depended on the life of the shepherd for their own life. And yet, in John 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who willingly lays down his life for the sheep. In this image, death means life. He intentionally, deliberately dies for, on behalf of, the sheep. Jesus uses substitution language here. Get the image. He dies... For dumb, defenseless, helpless, dirty sheep, he dies on their behalf. God the Son lives among the sheep. Like even that image itself, right? That God would stoop take on human flesh, and live among dirty, defenseless, dumb sheep. But not only does he live among us, he lays his life down for them. And it doesn't even really make sense. Why would a human, why would the Son of God die for sheep? Who dies for the sheep? Isaiah the prophet spoke of a Messiah who would come and die for the people, right? The sheeple, we could say. All we like sheep have gone astray, Isaiah says. And then he goes on to describe this scene, how the shepherd would die on behalf of the sheep. Who dies for sheep? Think about the Old Testament system. In the Old Testament sacrificial system, the sheep died in order to appease the shepherd, in order to appease God. Sheep were sacrificed, their blood was spilled so that the wrath of God could be appeased. But in the new covenant, in Jesus, the good shepherd dies for the sheep. God the Son dies for sinful humans. Humans, I might add, that will kill him. That doesn't even make sense. Because grace, the gospel, doesn't make sense. That the shepherd would die for the sheep. This truth alone separates Christianity from every other world religion. You see, in other world religions, listen to me closely. In other world religions, you often have to die for your God. And that's why people strap bombs on their backs. And that's why they hijack planes. And that's why they blow themselves up in crowds of people because they sacrificed themselves for their God. And in Christianity, God takes on human flesh and dies for us. This image is common throughout the New Testament. God the Son dying on our behalf, our substitution, that he is murdered for us, that he willingly dies so that we might live. Let me just quickly go through a few verses here. Revelation 1, 5, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins, how? By his blood. Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us and that while we were still, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for, there's that language, for us. Romans 8, 32, God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up, what, for 
us all. That's substitution language. Ephesians 5.25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 1 Peter 2.24 that we saw in our exile series. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed. Again and again and again and again throughout the New Testament we are reminded that our God took on human flesh and died in our place that the shepherd died for the sheep so that they, they might live. And then Jesus makes this stark contrast between the good shepherd and the hired hand. And we we see the difference is an ownership issue. It's the investment in the sheep. Look at chapter 10 and verse 12 as Jesus continues this imagery. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus said, hired hands flee from the danger because they're only committed to their own welfare. They're only committed to the paycheck. They're only committed to the job. The sheep are only there for their own self-advancement so that when the wolves come, the hired hand runs away because he's only in it for him. But the good shepherd lays down his life willingly to protect the flock. Here's why. Look at 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I and I lay down my life for the sheep. Here's why. Here's what separates the good shepherd from the hired hand in this text. The sheep belong to the shepherd. It's an ownership issue. There's a relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. They belong to them, to him. He loves them more than he loves his own life in this text. For the hired hand, sheep do not mean anything. They're a paycheck. They're not worth his life. There's no value in the sheep. Man, we have a tendency to sell our soul to the hired hand, don't we? We have a tendency to live our lives for the hired hands of this world that will use us temporarily and leave us when danger comes. And we will sell our souls pursuing the things that are not eternal. And we will sell our souls pursuing the things that are not lasting. And we will sell our souls pursuing the things that are temporary. And they leave us unprotected, unsafe, unloved, desperate. And yet the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. For the hired hand, sheep tending is just a job. He does it because it is a job, not because he loves the sheep. There's no ownership. It's the difference in renting a house and owning a house, right? When I rented a house, I was far less concerned with how I took care of it. If something broke, I'm on the phone calling somebody else up to fix it. When I own a house, I'm far more concerned of taking care of it and protecting it and watching over it and making sure that it is taken care of. The hired hand versus the good shepherd. And earlier in our text, we discovered that the shepherd knows the sheep by name. He has a relationship with them. They're not commodities. He loves them and cares for them and leads them. There's an intimacy factor. Listen, there's those of you that are in this room today and you are, you're, you're longing to be known by God. You keep God at an arm's distance because of life or because of you or because of the struggles that you have in your own heart. But there's a longing inside of you that desires to know God and to be known by God. There's a longing in your soul to be loved by God and to love God. 
And yet because of life or because of sinful choices or because of where you're at in life or, or because that something has happened, the brokenness has invaded your space and you've been hurt or you, you're unsure or you've lost hope or you've lost faith. And so your tendency is to keep God at an arm's distance, maybe willfully, maybe because something has happened in your life, but there's a desire in you to be known by God and be loved by God. And yet you're not there. Hear the gospel in John 10, that the shepherd laid down his life for you, that the shepherd knows you by name, that there's an ownership issue, that he knows you and loves you and desires to have a relationship with you. There is a God who has gone all the way to make that happen. There is a God that has gone to the point that he gave his own son for you, the sheep, the stinky, sinful, selfish sheep. God has gone all the way. You are valuable to him. Valuable enough for him to die in your place to make the ultimate sacrifice. Do not misunderstand or miss me here. That doesn't tell us how special the sheep are. That doesn't tell us how amazing the sheep are because of how valuable we are in God's sight. It doesn't tell us how amazing and special we are. It tells us how amazing the God that we serve is. That he lived among us as dirty, rotten, sinful, selfish sheep and not only lived among us, but he died on our behalf. The same ones that would nail him to a cross and murder him. He died on their behalf. Let's hit 17 and 18 and then we'll be done. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. What Jesus says is no one takes my life. I'm in control of life and death. I laid down my life for the sheep. Jesus died by choice. It wasn't by accident. It wasn't by fate. It wasn't because of a conspiracy. It wasn't a tragedy of misfortune that took the life of Jesus. He laid down his life voluntarily, took up the cross by choice. Now, let's be honest. This is not something new. A lot of people have died heroic deaths for other people. Others have laid down their lives in heroic sacrifice. That's not what's new here. What's new and what's different is Jesus laid it down, but he had the authority to take it up again. Don't miss this. The shepherd doesn't leave the sheep helpless and defenseless, which is what would happen if the shepherd just died. The sheep are lost without a shepherd. They too will reach their fate of death without the shepherd. But in our picture, the shepherd doesn't leave the sheep helpless and defenseless. He takes up his life again in order to provide life for the sheep. I love the description that John Piper gives us of this passage. Listen to Piper. When Jesus laid down his life for the sheep, he saved us from three destroying wolves, sin, death, and judgment. He saw them coming. He went out to meet them. He drew them away from the flock. But now, if the story ends here, there would be a great problem. If a flock of sheep lost their shepherd because he laid down his life to save them from a pack of wolves, they are now shepherdless. And even if no more wolves come, they will soon run out of green pasture. They will wander away. They will perish in the desert, in the valley of death. And in the end, they will not be saved, and the death of the shepherd will have been in vain. But our story doesn't end with a mangled shepherd lying, among, lying dead among three starving wolves and scattered sheep thirsting and starving in the desert. Instead, our sheep now have a shepherd. 
Christianity is not merely being saved from sin and death and judgment. It also means having a living shepherd to guide you and feed you and heal you and protect you and help you love. Jesus took his life back again from death so that we might have a personal relationship with all his sheep. The good shepherd did not remain dead. He does not remain bloody and beaten. Death mutilates his body, and then he gets up, and he conquers death. He takes back his life from death's chilly fingers so that he might offer life to the sheep to protect them and feed them and lead them and know them and love them. You see, Jesus laid down his life voluntarily and he took it back again authoritatively. Death does not have the final word. Jesus does. The resurrection validates his claim and provides life to the wandering sheep. Man, how valuable are sheep? How valuable are sheep? Well, if we're measuring value and worth in terms of intelligence or contribution or passion, they're not very valuable. They're not worth much at all. And the reality is, very few people that live on this earth will leave a lasting impact to the point that they're even remembered beyond a few paragraphs in human history. Most of us will live and die and never be remembered. Sheep are not very valuable in terms of self-worth, are we? But when we consider that we were created by Almighty God for the purpose of relationship. And then we blew that. We blew that and sinned. But God didn't give up. And He did what we could not do. He came to earth and He lived among the dirty, defiled sinful, selfish sheep. He lived among them. He became one of them. And he lived a life without sin. And then he voluntarily, voluntarily died the death that I deserved. The death that my sins caused. The consequences that my sin deserved. He died that death. And that's not the end of the story. Because after three days, he took back his life from death so that death doesn't win. And when you consider that reality, when you consider the reality that I have sinned against God, that God did not give up on me, but came into our world, lived among us, lived without sin, doing what I could not do to fulfill the demands of God's holy law, laying down his life voluntarily to take up death's curse, to take up death's penalty, that when, when he died, that my sins died with him, that my consequences died with him. When I consider the fact that he died on my behalf and then took up his life Again, for me, that tells me the sheep are valuable enough to the shepherd that he would die for them. Not what sheep, what awesome sheep we are. Instead, what an awesome shepherd he is. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today, the remembrance of this very sacrifice we're talking about. Before we do that, Matthew 26, Jesus is with his followers, his very last moments on earth. 
they gather to celebrate around Passover time in Jerusalem. Passover, Passover was a time that celebrated the very thing we're talking about. How sheep and animals lost their lives in order that blood could be spilled so that redemption would be made possible. And hundreds of thousands of Jews would gather and celebrate this event. And Jesus and his followers are there to celebrate. Except Jesus is about to change the game, rewrite the script. And as he sits with his followers that final night to celebrate Passover, he introduces a concept that ships everything. As Jesus lets them know the time of sacrifice is done, the days of Passover are done, the need to gather in the temple and bring spotless lambs and goats and and other animals to a priest to, to speak to God on your behalf. Those days are done. They're fulfilled. As Jesus says, there is only one lamb that is now required. See the paradox here that Jesus is both the shepherd and the final lamb it's a whole message in and of itself but in this moment that Jesus says all of that all the ritual all the old covenant all of God's demands are being fulfilled in this moment and there's something that we're going to do to celebrate that and Jesus institutes the beginning of the Lord's Supper communion the different titles that we give it Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 26, 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus says what we're doing through this bread and this wine is to celebrate, to remember that there is a lamb who laid down his life for the sheep, who laid down his life, that his blood was poured out for the many, that his blood was poured out for the followers, that his blood was poured out so that my sins might be forgiven, that Jesus died for the wandering sheep to forgive their sins and offer them eternal life. We celebrate, we gather week after week to celebrate the idea that he is the good shepherd who gave his life so that I might have life, that he poured out his blood so that I might live. He is a good shepherd, and I am his. Let's bow our heads for prayer.